Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, we have an action packed morning for you. And um, if you did take a sneak peek at the 2019 Quinlan lecture, what you'll be surprised to see is that um, this is about 80% new content. Uh, we removed from the 2019 lecture a lot of the things that uh, maybe weren't as exciting or relevant to modern pharma, uh, but retained a couple of things that we thought were still timely and useful. Um, we used to go through that lecture in a stepwise fashion with each of the disconnections shown on the top here and then going through case studies of each of them. But instead, we're going to structure it differently with the idea that probably many of you have already looked at the book, done the reading material, and maybe even taken a quick look at the video from two years ago. So with that in mind, we're going to present all the disconnections here, and they're kind of labeled in order of popularity in order of uh, the times you often see them employed. And um, after that, we'll basically get into the rest of this being case studies and um, looking into the reactivity and scope and the when and the why and the how of uh, using these different transformations to make quinolins. And then in the second part, we'll get into how one goes about making isoquinolins. Now, as I hope was clear from Friday's lecture, the point of learning all of these disconnections is not because you're necessarily going to be making tons and tons of quinolins or isoquinolins in your independent career. You'll make a lot of them. I see them often in consulting sessions in the real world. They're definitely valuable heterocycles that people use, but more often what you're going to see are where the benzene portion of the quinoline or the isoquinoline has been replaced with a another heterocycle. And that other heterocycle might be five-membered or six-membered and so that's why it's really important to know all of these different disconnections. All right, so starting from the top, uh, one of the sort of obvious ways of disconnecting this is just pretending you're dealing with a pyridine and think about the 1,5-dicarbonyl, which as you can see is lodged in there and hiding in the form of that aniline. Uh, moving to the left, uh, very, very popular ways of making these are through the A plus B disconnection, through these various condensations that take advantage of imine reactivity, and friedel crafts reactivity. And of course, the implicit challenge there, like we saw with um, fischer indole synthesis, for example, is <clears throat> the problematic regiochemical outcomes that you might get, depending on the substitution uh, surrounding your aromatic ring. And then we've got the uh, often used Heck or Laroque type logic, which cements your regiochemistry by starting with a halogenating material and then using some sort of palladium to get your desired coupling to take place, followed by a loss of water to generate your quinolin. Uh, then you've got a Friedlander, which can benefit from using friedel crafts chemistry or freeze rearrangement chemistry um, to cement yourself into a ortho anilinyl ketone. And then simply treating an, a ketone with base uh, will get you your desired uh, quinolin. Uh, the Dobner condensation is, um, can be useful on occasion. There is some scope limitation with that. And uh, we'll talk about a alternative to Dobner that goes by the name of Fissinger, which can often be a more useful way of achieving this type of reaction. Uh, then we'll move to the, <clears throat> you'll see as well, the A plus E disconnection, which is often used in the synthesis of quinolones and takes place by way of an addition through an SNAR reaction followed by uh, Michael and then loss of whatever your alkoxy substituent is here. Mm, the most famous application of this is a synthesis of a compound called Cipro, uh, which many of you may have taken over the years if you've been afflicted with some sort of bacterial infection. And uh, CAMPS uh, is a way of uh, forming this through an addition uh, to that carbonyl. And then finally, one of my favorites, uh, not used very often, but Boy, when you can identify this one, it is super powerful, it is a way of uh, using Vilsmeier logic uh, to form both the carbon-carbon bonds that you need on either side here and here, but also convert this during the process of the Vilsmeier to the corresponding aryl chloride, which is really useful medchem for doing your further uh, diversification. Okay, so that in a nutshell are all the most useful ways of making quinolins. And now we have to understand when do we apply these and how are they useful and how can the conditions be adjusted to give you different product distributions. And so for this, we've got problem today number one 
And uh, luckily, Sung Han has val uh, volunteered to help us with understanding what the selectivity in this type of reaction might be. So what do you say, Sung Han? What are your thoughts here on possible outcomes when you mix that keto ester with aniline? Uh, so I think if initially we treat the reaction under room temperature, the ketone must more electrophilic. So I think the first condition, the aniline will react with ketone and form the imine. And then when you heat it, what happens? Yeah, when we heat it, I think we can get compound A. Okay, so Sung Han says A, he, he of course might be wrong. Um, what about for uh, the other set of conditions where we just heat this thing up with an acid? What do you think is going on there? So when we hit the reaction, I think the aniline can attack the ester because it will form a thermodynamic stable amide bond. Subsequently, we give B. Yeah, that's what I think. Does anybody disagree with this analysis? Want to challenge Sheng Han? Okay, it looks like everybody's in agreement and you're absolutely right. So yeah. Um, these kind of condensation chemistries can be controlled. Uh, you see this a lot. And um, so that's absolutely right. A great way to get isomeric um, quinolones, which of course you can treat with POCl3 and start doing all sorts of diversity insulation. Let's take a look at this example, uh, which is from the old literature, uh, one of the first synthesis of chloroquine, which was a um, early medication for malaria. I um, should note that the earliest medication for malaria that I could find was um, the capture of a certain type of spider and wrapping it up in uh, molasses and then drinking that. So uh, medicine has come quite a, quite a way uh, from those uh, dreary early days. So using Sung Han's logic, after we take this compound, we've got two possible carbonyl groups that can be attacked. Uh, Sung Han, do you have a preference on which one we're going to make an initial adduct to? Uh, I think B. Why? Because it is a ketone. It is not only a ketone, but boy, it's really active. So this is super, super, super delta plus. That thing wants to react violently with a nucleophile. And after we heat it up, it will undergo some sort of reaction that I think we saw last Friday basically the friedel crafts to give you that product. Great. Now we're going to treat this with KOH. KOH really doesn't have much of a choice but to hydrolyze that ester. And then when you heat it up to high temperature, there's really not much else for it to do but to lose CO2. And then when we treat this with PLCL3, there's really not much for the compound to do but to form that. So we're all good there. We can then do our SNAR reaction to get chloroquine. And this was done all the way back in the 40s. Let's move on to the next talk example. A little bit about the selectivity of that. Uh, selectivity of what? There are two chlorines. Oh, yeah. So why do you think it only goes there? You tell me. Um, I think because uh, I guess it's in the four position of like a pyridine. Yeah, this one is invisible. This one is as, you know, if you take, uh, let's say you take uh, chlorobenzene and you reflux it with an amine, does anything happen? Nope. And so for this molecule, this is chlorine is pretty much invisible. Whereas this one here, when I see it, I see, well, this is what I'm looking at in my head. You think this will react quickly with an amine? Yeah. So that's, that's what I'm seeing. Great, great question. Uh, please don't do SNARs on chlorines like that, unless your chlorine has got some sort of electron withdrawing group. Now the story is different, okay? All right. I also want to ask that uh, why the selectivity of the, the previous step happens on the 
a pair position instead of the ortho position of chlorine. You mean uh, after the decarboxylation, which- uh, I mean, yeah, this step. Yeah, so why does it not give that? Uh, no, I, I mean the ring, ring closure. Oh. Yeah, yeah, this step. Oh, I- Is I, this a electronic I mean, effect or a steric effect? Yeah, it, it's probably um, a steric effect. In general, you're going to expect, just like the Fisher and all the other ones, in, in general, we'll see an exception to that today. In general, you're going to usually do your condensation away from the chlorine. Um, you probably, there is probably a little bit of the other regioisomer in this uh, mixture, but um, it, you know, gets purified away through crystallization or, or however they're doing this in the 1940s. But in general, the rule of thumb is when you're doing these condensations, you're going to do them away from the substituent. Yeah, good question. Use that as your rule of thumb. Um, and that rule of thumb can be used on the exam or during a job interview. It's certainly logical. No one's going to penalize you for that. All right, great. Let's move on to this example, which is kind of a modern variant um, that allows one to do a simple version of a scalp reaction. Now, the scalp reaction, we didn't really talk about it. It's up here. It's known as kind of the witch's brew of heterocyclic chemistry and generally involves taking a aniline with substitution and heating it up with, um, sorry, an extra carbon there, heating it up with glycerol and, um, it is one of the messiest reactions you can possibly imagine. Uh, and the best way to isolate products from this usual, usually black tar is to react it with uh, the crude with zinc chloride, which makes your uh, quinoline zinc adduct, which is crystalline that can be filtered away and then liberated to give product. So that's a sneaky trick to make the scrap work for you, but um, this is a, a messy reaction because of the need for the elimination to take place. There's an oxidation that takes place. And um, so an alter many alternatives to scrap have come out. And this is sort of one that will give you minimal substitution in a stepwise fashion that is much more clean. And so um, in this first step, Brendan, what is gonna take place? Um, just addition into the night trial. All right. <clears throat> and then? And then hydrolysis to the <clears throat> aldehyde and cyclization. What did you say? Hydrolysis to what? Not, not the aldehyde, the, um, the carboxylate. Okay. And then uh, cyclization by a, a Frito Crafts type mechanism. And uh, the only problem with this is I put some saturation doesn't belong there. So I get that. And then this palladium on carbon with heat. Brendan, what do you suspect that does? Um, it's going to desaturate there. Just you, yeah, you uh, spilled the beans. But yeah, and then uh, PLCO3 is going to make the, the chloride there. <clears throat> Brilliant. OK, fantastic. And this is a updated way to make an intermediate that can be useful for uh, malarials. Let's go on to some new stuff from the real world. These are real consulting problems from the archives. And um, in order to help us with this, maybe Tawe can let us know what he's thinking. First shocking thing about these consulting corner problems is that these are not quinolins, are they? Mm. I think and, maybe we can yeah. cut the uh, and, and nitrogen nitrogen bound. But have we learned how to do that yet? Uh, what is this heterocycle? Have we learned this yet? I think not yet. No, no, not yet. That's a pyrazole. Um, right now, I have no idea how to make pyrazoles. I've never seen them before. So I'm really confused, and I have to default back to quinoline logic. So the trick is like this, folks. If there's a heterocycle you've never seen, but you know one of them you have seen, guess what you can do? Just pretend...
What if I gave it to you as this compound? You can just pretend it's that. Because we haven't learned pyrazoles yet. We don't want to break that NN bond because we don't know what to do after that. And by the way, if we did do that, it would lead to a rather complicated pyridine. Uh, we'll get into how to make heterocycles like this, the uh, pyrazole pyridines, uh, after the midterm. But because we haven't taught it yet, I'm trying to guide you in a direction that's going to lead us to uh, the desired product without needing to know how to make a pyrazole. That's the beauty of knowing how to make quinolins is that it teaches you how to make all these other things. So if we have no idea how to make this, all we're going to do is think about, well, it's very likely we could get an intermediate like this. Just like no one would have a problem ordering some of this. And if we took this compound plus, let's say, our alkyl or our group, whatever, and we went back up to our handy dandy cheat sheet, uh, wow, look at that. There it is. So we know we can do that. We learned it already in class. These two are going to be put together with a little palladium. The adduct you will initially get will be this. And uh, oh my, look what we've got here. All we need to do is treat this thing with bromine. And uh, that's going to give us directly what we want. After aromatization, the loss of HBR. Can we use the corresponding ketone instead of the secondary alcohol in the first step? Uh, you certainly can. The only issue with doing that, the reason we want to uh, use this oxidation state is because I don't want it to aromatize yet. If I aromatize prematurely, then I have the compound here with H, and now I don't have a good way of regislectively brominating. So the sneaky trick in this consulting suggestion uh, is that we're using the aromatization step as a vehicle to put the bromine in the right spot. There's no literature I can give you for this. This is like straight out of a real suggestion. But that's a great question. That's the reason I'm not using the carbonyl here because I want to intercept this intermediate. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. All right, great, Tawei. So um, you're such an expert at this now. Why don't you help us with this next one? Uh, have you ever seen this heterocycle before? Oh, no. Yeah, me neither. I never seen that. I don't know what that is. I have to wait till next semester till after the midterm to learn what that is. So if I don't know what this is, I'm just going to pretend I have that. And if you get really nervous during a job interview, you can use the same trick. Just pretend it's that. And if you pretend it's that, uh, we can do something else which is simplifying because we know from the chloroquine examples we just saw that you should be able to do something like this. Okay, so that's viable, just adding in an amine. And now we go back up to our handy dandy cheat sheet up here. Let's see, what can we do? Hmm, well, Friedlander looks like it might be a good possibility. Let's go back down here and see if it fits. Now all we need to do is think about how we're gonna get our hands on this compound. The only thing you need to go to SciFinder for is this, and you'll find, whoa, one step preparation, which we will learn how to make these oxidizoles when we get to that part of the class. Um, it's a one step prep, but it's also commercial and cheap. The alternative, think about the alternative, folks. I mean, does the alternative look you know, pleasing to you? Uh, you're going to need something like that. 
X can be maybe, you know, nitro or halide or something. And then you're going to have to think about how you, you know, put that in. Uh, Tawe, do you like that disconnection? Yeah, I think it's pretty good. Uh, well, I don't like this. Uh, do you mean the first one or the yeah, first one? The, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so it's just sort of intuitive then that you just pretend this thing is an aromatic ring and yeah. then just do your disconnection and wait for later to figure out what the rest is going to be. And if you've never seen an oxidizole before, you go into SciFinder in a much better position. Good luck SciFindering that one. You're going to find tons of nonsense. Whereas if you SciFinder this one, it's your first hit, commercial cheap, done. Okay, great. For this disconnection, or yep. for this specific example, could you also imagine using like something in the Combs scrap world, like in that that sort of A B disconnection. So that type plus why do you think I didn't want to do that when I made my disconnection? You tell me. The regiochem of that? Well, I'm not worried about the regiochemistry. I mean, there's only one place it can go. There's no regiochemical problem. I mean, um, you know, I, I would suppose maybe this would <clears throat> be fine to make an imine. And, uh, but I've got something else that's problematic with this. Do so then I guess like that, what would be like friedel crafts kind of chemistry wouldn't be good to cyclize? Yeah, it's very electron deficient heterocycle. It's probably not going to be that great. This amino is probably also not that good at making an imine. So um, it doesn't feel very good. And uh, that's why, you know, trying to, trying to put the uh, carbonyl in place from the beginning is the one I would search for first. And when you search for it, you find, oh, there's a one step prep. And then when you take the rest of the class, you realize, oh, this is a really easy compound to make because you can identify that hiding in there is ethyl cyanoacetate. But we'll talk about that later. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Yeah, great question. All right, great. Um, so as I mentioned before, the Dobner reaction is uh, a, a useful reaction, but in some cases it just doesn't work in a far more general way of achieving the same type of disconnection is by using a reaction called the Fitzinger, which is encapsulated within problem of video number two. And uh, luckily, Ellie can help us on some thoughts as to what might be happening in problem of the day number two. Um, yeah, so I think that the potassium hydroxide would deprotonate the methyl group. Okay. And then that would attack one of the um, carbonyls of the, I forget what they're called. Isotin? Um, Isotin, yeah. And then it could open it up. Which one do you want it to attack? Um, uh, the one closest to the nitrogen, I think. Hmm. But don't you think that's going to be a bit of an issue? Because an amide carbonyl, hmm. So, what I want you to do instead of thinking about these two reagents together is what do you what do you think if we just treated this thing with KOH? You could unravel it. Let's imagine we did exactly what you said before, but the KOH and heat eventually unravels it to this, and then we're going to take advantage of what you just suggested. So let's imagine it gives us this compound in C2. And now we're going to do what you said, but instead, we're going to take advantage of that carbonyl. Yeah. And finally, we'll do our deprotonation by the enamine. To give us that. That's Fitzinger. <clears throat> now, Ellie, we're not done with you. So 
using that same logic then, uh, used to be when I taught Fissinger, people rolled their eyes like, yeah, we're never gonna need this. So instead we've sort of added to some proof that you will need it. Um, this is a paper from J. Medchem from Pfizer. And uh, so using the same logic, what would be my starting material here, Ellie? Um, an isotin. Okay, let's draw the isotin. And now my other component. I know um, cyclopropane, let's draw that cyclopropane. Okay, I just need to know what's here. A carboxylic acid? Oh wait, no. So the disconnection we're gonna do essentially is right here, correct? Yeah. So I just need to stitch that back together. And in order to stitch it back together, I'm gonna to need to put a carbon here, because that's right here. And I'm gonna to need to put some sort of placeholder like that, because that is right here, correct? Yeah. And that's all I need. That's how they did it. Now, how do we make this thing? There are two ways of making this, one of which is called the Sandmeyer, which will be a problem of the day coming up that I'm not gonna cover now. So option one is Sandmeyer. Um, is there any other option that uh, folks can think about? Anyone can offer a suggestion here. Some of you might say, why don't we make the indole and then oxidize it? Um, that could be okay. But then you've got to make that indole. Another way to think about this might be just to imagine that would give you the product, right? And then we learned all about the power of directed lithiation. So, Yuli, we'll give you a nice, clean, directed deprotonation there by the NH Bach. We'll then quench it with an oxalate, and then we just deprotect and we get out the isotin. That's method one of making an isotin. That will be the most useful you'll see out there. And then another way of doing it is through Sandmeyer, and we'll see that in, in just a few minutes. So just a question about this sure. molecule. So yeah. would, would you ex expect a CF3 will be stable? Because uh, if the, the lone pair on nitrogen push back to the ring and the- Yeah, that's a great, great question. I think if you were to um, take the free aniline, as we learned before, and treat that with base and a nucleophile, you'll start getting HF elimination. But at low temperature, when you do the deprotonation, you simply get the lithiation to take place faster than you get any loss of uh, fluoride. So that's a great question. We talked about anionically activated groups uh, being a liability for CF3s that are in the ortho and power positions, but that's usually under thermodynamic conditions with heat. Low temperature lithiations are fine and safe, no worries. Okay, thank you. Yeah, great, great point. Other questions? Um, if you, instead of using like doing a directed uh, location, can you, if you just treat it with oxalic chloride, would you get like a my formation and then fetal craft? Or would that not be fast? Oh, that enough? can work. Yeah, you, you, yeah, I, I think that can work. Yeah. Um, you usually don't. Um, I don't, what you could do is like a, as a freeze rearrangement, I think to get the product to form, but yeah, that might be a way of um, getting product nor, uh, I, you know, I can't say that that's necessarily a problem. And then treating this with acid, you mean? Well, I just, 
thought like thought if I just add oxalic chloride, you'd get uh huh um, yeah oh yeah first edition, and then instead of the methoxy, you'd have like a more activated version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That might work. Yeah, we can we can check that on, uh, to make sure that that disconnection is on SciFinder. But I think that's fine. Yeah, that might that Thanks. might work out fine. Yeah. Why yeah. do we cyclize it into the five member ring? Instead of just using the coupling reagent to react with the the intermediate. Say that again. How do you say that again? What's the oh, question? How way? Is that called a uh, I I setting? Yes. 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 Uh, oh, why do we cyclize this the intermediate into the isotene structure instead of using the 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 other coupling reagent to react with the intermediate directly? Oh, you mean. Why don't we just use this compound directly in the coupling instead of uh, doing Fitzinger? Yeah. Yeah. You just have to remove the Bach. And then once you remove the Bach, it cyclizes the isotin anyway. Oh, OK. Yeah. And I think that isotin is just a nice, stable intermediate that they can do a lot of modular uh, Fitzinger chemistry with. But that, that, that's a great point. If you, know, you had one that didn't, for some reason, cyclize to the isotin and was stable as a preamine, you could certainly employ that in the same type of reaction. Yep. That would certainly work that way. Good point. All right, great. So let's move on to um, another way of making uh, quinolones here. That's, I think, really cool. And it comes from the Pfizer process team. It's a very sneaky way of achieving the formation of a key intermediate needed to make an isoquinolone by taking advantage of the inherent reactivity of aryl nitros. So for a problem of the day number three, luckily Alex will help us with a, uh, a stepwise uh, explanation for what is going on here. So will you have deprotonation um, of like the methylene, yeah. And then, um, <laughs> well, that, will that do, like, will that add into the, um, airing directly? Mm. Like, so like some sort of SNIR type thing. Now what? Then you will, I guess if you can push arrows around with your proton that you just showed, like deep to cyclize. Well, essentially all we need to do is that. Yeah. And then lose water and we've got our product. Now we haven't learned about uh, these interesting, uh, what, is there a question from the outside? Oh yeah, well, we, we haven't learned so far about these interesting iso uh, ben benzoxazoles, uh, but they're great placeholders because you can open up that NO bond. And when you do, you get out something which now looks like a great precursor. Hey, Phil, would you say that that last reaction Alex walked through is like VNS or no? It is, it is a VNS type reaction. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and now all we have to do to finish is uh, use the standard reaction. I believe this is CAMPS uh, to get out the product. So treat that with silicon hydride and a little base and um, Get out that. Pretty nifty, huh? Okay, this was kilograms scale. Let's move on to problem of the day number four. 
So for problem day number four, uh, maybe Noor can help us out with um, the question, which is how to make this compound using disconnections B and C. What reagents and positions would you use? What starting material might be logical here? Um, I think so. I'd use um, an, an acyl um, um, called aniline and just an aldehyde, formaldehyde in this case, I think. Like this, correct? Yeah. What's a good formal equivalent that we learned that would simultaneously take us to the chloro that we need here? Oh, right, um, that would be the, oh, the, the meth column. So you have a Biltmeyer. Yep, Biltmeyer. Okay, region. that sounds great. So if we take this compound and simply treat it with PLCL3 and DMF, we get out the product. How do you like that? Great, thanks, Noor. All right, now we have radio chem. Oh, question from the outside? Yeah. yeah before we start with that, uh, some of the stuff that we know about that previous reaction. Were, what previous reaction? So uh, the OPRD example. Yes. Uh, the loss of cyanide, the problem on uh, Oh, yeah. Um, that is a good question. As long as you work up the reaction carefully so you don't have HCN, you're fine. But um, yeah, that definitely is something that probably went into their analysis of sort of making sure that that reaction is safe. It's only one equivalent, uh, but you got to be careful in the way you work it up so you don't have HCN uh, liberated. But yeah, um, I've seen people use uh, reactions on process scale that liberate cyanide. Uh, what you see people avoid a lot, though, are the use of things like TMS cyanide on scale, because often that's used in excess in the reagent itself can be rather dangerous. But if your reaction liberates cyanide, it can be uh, it can be managed in the way you work it out, but yeah, it's a great question. All right, we need a radio chemist. So we've got um, today with us Tim, Aaron, Camille, and Stone, and this is a C14 label straight out of the literature. So need some thoughts from you as to how in the world we're going to pull this off. One of the radio chemists hopefully can help us. Disconnect to the aldehyde. Which aldehyde? I'm going to label it to make it easy for you. There we go. Um, like uh, the four aldehyde. Oh, you mean ketone? That would be that would be a ketone. If I put a carbonyl group, that would be a ketone. Is that what you mean? Oh, uh, I, I was I was initially thinking uh, have like the benzaldehyde of the bottom barrel. Well, yeah. four is fine, but four can correspond to the four five or yeah, four sorry. seven. Which one? Four five or four seven? I don't know which aldehyde you want. Sorry, yeah, I, I think the ketone would be better. The ketone, okay, let's let's try that out. And then we need this component here, which can be Or right, yeah. And now help me make this compound. What's the best way do you think we're going to get to that? Uh, Trace me back to my C fourteen. Where's my C fourteen label coming from eventually? Labeled phosgene. Labeled phosgene is one idea so you're thinking of stitching the two ars together ar1 plus ar2 plus 
that? Potentially. Potentially. Do you like phosgene? No. Yeah, neither do I. Do you want to deal with radio label phosgene? No, but it's a starting material that is radio labeled, I guess. Yeah. Is there something even cheaper and safer? DMF. Uh, then no. you have the wrong oxidation state. What's the same oxidation state of phosgene, but maybe easier to deal with? Uh, like a chloroformate or something? Could be chloroformate or even simpler, the stuff you're breathing right now could just use CO2. Right. So we could take, in principle, let's say we have O mom here. It's a nice uh, directing group. We make, we lithiate that thing. Uh, we then quench with labeled CO2. And then once we have that in hand, all we need to do is take NH Bach, we already learned how we can nicely lithiate there, react that with the corresponding ester we have just made. Or the acid chloride, whatever, whatever you want. Mix these two together. Then uh, dump in your enolate of the lactone. Then treat the whole thing with acid and deprotect, and you're done. So a minimum amount of uh, C14 labeling chemistry is involved. Uh, you're basically carrying this through two or three steps, depending on how you telescope it. Super. Questions? Let's move on to a natural product that we've never covered before. This is a very nice one. This was isolated by the Fenical group many years ago now uh, called amosamide. And the amosamides have some very intriguing bioactivity associated with them. And so there was a rush of effort from not only the Fenical group, but other groups as well, to try to put this thing together in a rapid way that would be amenable to analog synthesis. So the first groups that you think we can remove here, uh, Nick, is there a uh, initial simplification of this that we can make very rapidly to just make our life a little bit easier. And if Nick is not here, we'll just go straight to Fang. Um. Probably you can cleave the five membered ring. We're going to do that for sure, but are there certain atoms on here we can just get rid of right away to make everything easier? Oh, the X. Yeah, let's get rid of that. Let's just make it that. Let's not worry about the sulfur for now. Put that there. And let's not worry about that amide. Let's just put an ester there to make things easier. And now when we look at this, there's a few ways we can go. One of which is quite intuitive based on the things we just learned um, a second ago. So uh, Fang recommended that we cleave the five member ring. And uh, that's a really good idea. You can also look at this and say, well, wait a minute. We've seen this motif before, namely Esther here and Esther there. And so you can imagine possibly just doing a whole disconnection right across there. Look what happens now. If we do that, we'll worry about methylation later. That would give us our product directly by way of the chemistry we just saw, where we have a functionalization there, Frito perhaps there, amidation there. And then this compound just comes back from something pretty simple. That makes sense to you, Feng? 
Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Uh, the other way of thinking about this would maybe be thinking about doing it in a more stepwise fashion. We're in, we're going to think about this being derived from some sort of isotope. Now, you might be suspecting I'm going to say Fitzinger, but it's not the case. And if you subject this to a Wittig reaction, followed by PLCO3, you get out this product directly. Subsequently, you can nitrate that position, and you see how that maps on pretty well to the final structure of the product. So you can look in well, to the uh, literature cited here if you want to see the exact routes that they used. Uh, one of them is definitely more amenable to making analogs, uh, but the logic of the two is uh, shown here. In my opinion, this first one is a little bit more intuitive and follows sort of the line of what we've been talking about in the class. Any questions on a Mo side? Phil? Yes. Instead of doing the video, could you not just do the Friedlander? Or does that not work on acyl chlorides? Um, that work on acyl chloride. I think you, like, I, I don't see an issue with uh, proposing on paper the coupling of this compound with this one and base. I do not see an issue with that. Um, yeah. I think you're fine on there. Do you guys see a problem with that? No, we're, we're, we're okay with that on paper. It could be they tried that and it didn't work, which is why they went to the Vidic, but like on an exam, we can't fault you for that. Yeah, great. Put a question mark, don't know if that works, but certainly good on paper. Okay, now let's move to a, a nice cage match between two giants in the field, um, Corey and Weinrep. And the cool part of this case study and the reason we uh, included it from earlier lectures is that it is really instructive in thinking about how you can't go wrong disconnecting this molecule in a couple of different ways. You've got three ring systems here. You can view A as a pyrrole. You could also view it as an indole. Uh, B is a kind of benzo substituent that has been fully oxidized. And then C, you can view it as a pyridine or you could view it as a quinoline. And so what's really interesting about comparing and contrasting these two routes is the fact that Corey and Weinreb took exactly opposite approaches from a retrosynthetic perspective, wherein, as we'll see in just a moment, Corey decided to start with the A ring and build out from there to the C ring, whereas Weinreb took exactly the opposite approach of starting with C and moving to A. So with that, let's trace through the synthesis of methoxetin by Corey that begins with this readily available nitromethoxy analyte. And to help us with this first step, perhaps Kelly can tell us what is this strange concoction of formic acid and acetic hydride going to do in this initial step? Um, are you just gonna condense onto the aniline nitrogen? Formic acid, which gives you the formamide. Following that, we're gonna reduce it down to the aniline. After that, we're gonna treat this with sodium nitrate, Kelly, and that's gonna do what? Make the diazonium salt. And then? And then that can do Jack Klingman with the other piece. Brilliant.
then treating that with formic acid uh, does what, do you think? You form the parole in a fissure. Awesome. And now what do we have to do? Treat this with HCl and heat first. To reveal the aniline again. Okay, so the HCl and heat is going to reveal deprotection of the formamide to the aniline. And then uh, this, which we, a reagent which we have just seen a minute ago, is going to do what? Cyclize onto the aniline and then do Friedel crafts to form your ring. Awesome sort of beautifully intuitive, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And that's how you get your product, great. Now let's move on to wine rebs. And uh, wine rebs begins with the Sandmeyer reaction, which Simona luckily is going to help us with in problem of the day number five. So in this concoction, we take chloral, shown here, hydroxylamine and a dehydrating agent, mix them together with an aniline and um, that's your product. So what is going on here? Any thoughts? Um, yeah, does your hydroxylamine react with the chloral? Then? And then, uh, can you push electrons to kick off a chloride to make your electrophile? And then? And your aniline can add in to this electrophile. And then it kicks off the chlorines to form the product. And I guess, yeah, we have the. Water can add in. Awesome. Perfect, Simona. All right, why don't you keep going? Well, when we treat that with PP, uh, PPA, you know what the product is because the name of the reaction, so. What the isotone. It? Perfect. Yes. Yeah. So this is a Sandmeyer isotone synthesis, and that's how wine red begins. So following that, we have a name reaction we've learned uh, about a dozen times at this time at this moment. And um, Bissinger. Perfect. And uh, now we have to do something tricky here, Simona. Uh, I don't know what's going on here. I'll need some help. Uh, we're treating this with NBS and maybe a radical initiator. Then we're using um, nitration conditions. And then finally, sodium hydride and... Um, well, would you have uh, a ben benzoic bromination followed by a nitration? And then? And then uh, you could deprotonate and then uh, alkylate. Doing that. Okay. Long spot with epoxy. Great. Now we're at this pivotal step that looks like what Kelly just told us before. The Jeff Klingman. Jeff Klingman.
which you can go ahead and tell me what that next step is going to do. Um, you can reduce your nitro to the amine. And do you think that's going to stick around for a long time? No, that's probably going to um, cyclize. And the only difference in the end game is how they oxidize. Let's just put um, general oxidation. If you're interested in how they do that, you can read about it. But totally different strategy gets to the same goal here. Fantastic. So let's move on then to this interesting uh, VLA4 antagonist that was made on kilogram scale. Um, Oh, and it looks like we skipped problem to number six, but we got it. Um, Simone already solved it. So we're good there, yeah. So that one's already done. Let's move on to this VLA4 antagonist. And to help us with this one, luckily, uh, Daniel's gonna give us some thoughts on groups we can get rid of really quickly. Uh, I basically am looking for anything you're thinking about when you see this molecule. Just give us some thoughts. Things we can get rid of, things you're not worried about, things you are worried about, um, so first maybe the amide bond, you can cleave that. Okay, so we can think about that being something we can get rid of later on um, to make things possibly a little bit simpler. What other things are you thinking about when you look at this molecule? Does the amino acid bother you? Uh, I mean, yeah, like the phenylalanine, maybe you could start with some kind of derivative from that and maybe um, put the place of nitrogen ortho to that methylene. I'm sorry, uh, para to the methylene. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So and then I like, I like where you're going with that. Are you, are you worried at all during the synthesis of uh, the quinoline that it might lead to a racemization event? Oh. Like, isn't that something you're you, it just sort of in your design? As a process chemist, are you worried about that? Yeah. Yeah, I would be. So this is a readily available compound, just sort of the amino tyrosine. And so when we think about how to put this together, first and foremost in our logic is going to be finding the conditions which are the most mild we can possibly find. Luckily, we don't have to worry about regiochemistry because it's symmetrical. But what we do have to worry about here, key to thinking about how we're going to do this, is mild nature of the reaction conditions. So with that in mind, uh, Daniel, do you want to add anything? Um, or I'll go ahead. All I know are, are ones not to do. Tell me what not to do. Uh, Scrout. <laughs> Great, let's not do that. Um, you know, I don't, I also process scale. I don't want it to be doing a Suzuki coupling here. So let's try to bring that in from a commercially available compound somehow. So I don't want to do any cross coupling if I can avoid it on kilogram scale. I don't want conditions which are going to racemize. I don't want black tarry mixtures like a scrout. Uh, I don't want POCL3 chemistry. It's not going to just be stable in the presence of all this stuff. So what they do in a very brilliant fashion is to take this and react it with the dichlorobenzaldehyde, which is a cheap commodity chemical. That gives them this intermediate. And then they can use a reaction that um, is an old one, it's a known one, it's a good one. It's called the Pavarov. And it involves taking an enamide, but you can also use enol ethers are fine too. That's fine too. This is also just fine. And uh, when you add this in with a little bit of mild acid, so 
product you get. And uh, Daniel, how are we going to go from this to the desired product? What do we need to do? In general, we're going to have to do two things, right? So cleave, cleave off that nitrogen carbon yeah. bond. Yes, exactly. We're going to have to eliminate this, which should leave pretty gracefully. Okay, I, I was I was kind of wondering like how how strong those conditions would need to be. Oh no no because these okay. want to be aromatic. This is a great leaving group. It's in the benzoic okay. position. Not only is it in benzoic position, but check this out. It's got this driving force too. So it is begging to get out of there. Okay, so it gets out of there just with continued acid treatment and um, a little bit of O2 eight percent O2 stream will give you the oxidation that you need to get to the final product process scale. And you don't get the racemization. Pretty cool, huh? All right, great. Well, we are done with uh, quinolins. Um, so now we have to move on to isoquinolins, which simply differ by taking that nitrogen atom and moving it over one. And uh, the most uh, popular way of doing this is obviously, probably you've learned it already, the, all the kind of Friedel Crafts chemistry that fits into this category. And there was Bischler and Nikorowski, depending on the oxidation state of your group donor here. And there were all the Pictet reactions that it was great golden era of the Pictet lab to be a student in that lab because your name would forever be emboldened in the future of name reactions and heterocyclic chemistry. And the GAMS, Uber, and Spangler just really differ on what the X group is here, the different oxidation state that's going on there. But they're all just picked that Spangler type is how you can think about it. I certainly don't memorize the nuance between GAMS, Uber, and Spangler. It's all the same to me. There's, of course, the Pomerantz Fritsch, which is a really valuable way of making uh, isoquinolins and relies upon uh, Friedel Crafts chemistry, just like the Bischoff Neporowski and picked that Spangler. However, we've done the opposing disconnection instead of breaking the carbon nitrogen uh, bond in tandem with the carbon arrow bond we're going to be breaking the carbon carbon bond shown here and condensing with a useful uh, uh, intermediate like that and then as we move on sort of a logical way to think about this would be one five dicarbonyl logic it's not used that often however um, far more often the the use of 1,5-dicarbonyl logic, as far as I've seen, and we're going to see this a lot on Wednesday, is using this intermediate. So remember that. We're going to see it, I think, today. We're going to see it uh, a lot on Wednesday. 1,5-dicarbonyl logic almost never manifests itself in the form of a dialdehyde. It almost always is seen in the case of the dinitrile. That is a very useful way of forging isoquinolin type species. And then finally, you have the Gabriel Coleman, which uh, can be seen on occasion, but is quite rare. All right, so let's take a look at some of this stuff in the real world. And uh, we get to a Pfizer JMED chem paper. Uh, that shows the synthesis of an interesting compound here. And Carter, luckily, is going to help us with some initial analysis on, I want you to just break this down for us to the simplest construct that we can start thinking about how to make. Give us something really simple. What substituents can we get rid of? What can we do here, Carter? Uh, can we first get rid of the uh, sulfonate? Yeah, I don't like any the of the sulfonamide. Let's get rid of that. OK. Anything else we can get rid of? Um, I guess condensing on to the, would be like a, a urea. Uh, yeah, get rid of this guanidine. I don't like that either. So once we get rid of these things, look what happens. Where in here, you can imagine doing some sort of uh, halogen metal exchange quenching with 
uh, SO, SOCl2, and then subsequently the sulfonyl chloride can be converted into a sulfonamide, no problem. And then we can imagine some SNAR chemistry. As we learned before, uh, the selectivity of that one is going to be great, whereas this one, as uh, Tim taught us, is kind of like chlorobenzene, so we don't have to worry about that one at all. So all we need is a nifty, fast way to make this key building block, and we are done. Carter, any ideas? You said, I like what you said. You said uh, urea or uh, a amide and uh, the dehydration of that. So if we take what you already said, what I can interpret it to mean is that we would start from something like that. Is that what you meant? Yeah. Great. Now, how would you take this component and convert it to there? Give me some idea of a condition. You Vilsmeyer? Well, Vilsmeyer, or what you mean maybe is leave out the DMF because not adding any carbon atoms. You just mean PLCl3, right? Yeah. Yeah. So PLCl3 would take care of the C2 chloro. That's fine. How do I put this one in? Um, is, this, is this position innately primed for electrophilic attack? What do you think? I would say, I guess, slightly, even though you have some... Yeah, it is because it looks like an enamide, doesn't it? Yeah, I was gonna say even even with the nitrogen lone pairs tied up slightly, it's still electron rich. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So instead of using PLCl3, I can use PCl5, which accomplishes first chlorination here, and then subsequently PLCl3 like reactivity takes over, and you get out the dichloro compound. Now all I need to do, assuming this is not available from all rich or combi blocks, is figure out a way to make that. And we already learned a way to do it on Friday's lecture. Uh, does anybody remember? Courteous. Courteous, thank you. Courteous and about 180 degrees of heat. And you got your product. How easy is that? I mean, look at this first species, it's kind of intimidating. And then this last one is like nothing. So the complexity of these can be reduced very, very rapidly. So for problem of the day number seven. Oh, quick quick question. You, sure, Daniel, what do you say? Do they really want to use PCL5? Isn't that like pretty reactive? Oh, PCL5 is not too bad. It's MedChem. Okay. It's MedChem. Look, I, I, I thought, like your question. And if so, somebody asked me, hey, I don't want to use PCL5. Is there a better way to do it? I would say talk to Daniel. So can you give me another reagent that would be uh, good for electrophilic uh, chlorination? Uh, in NCS? Yeah, so Daniel would suggest using NCS first, followed by PLCL3, and they would definitely hire you back. Okay. Great. So henceforth, I will submit all recommendations on chlorination to you, Daniel. So keep your email open. All right, great. So problem of the day number seven, uh, Jun Chen has uh, kindly uh, volunteered to give us some strategies for um, addressing what encompasses hundreds of alkaloids out there, these isoquinolone, uh, these isoquinoline type alkaloids, there's hundreds of them out there. Give us two general speculative ways that you would recommend, let's say a MedChem team that wanted to make tons of analogs of a compound like this. What are the ways that you would put this together? Can you give us some suggestions? Yeah, my... My let, me label, let me label it so it's easy for you to tell me what you're thinking. Maybe my maybe my first raw don't need to label just hydration, hydrogenation of the isoquinone. And then you're gonna need to okay, so that's great. And there's a lot of literature now that's uh rapidly emerging on a daily basis for asymmetric hydrogenation methods for doing this. And that is a phenomenal way to do it. And then we just need a way of making that um, compound. Using the, we just talked the uh, Curtis strategy, make the uh, lactam first and then do something like cross coupling. Oh, cross coupling. Oh, Chen Chen, cross coupling. Hmm. You want to cross couple, huh? 
that, that might be okay for analogs, but is there, a, what if I tell you that the world has uh, run out of cross coupling conditions for this? Which is ironic because you're going to need that for the hydrogenation. So, but what if you can't use cross coupling to put that in? Is there another strategy you can use to get us there? Mm. Uh, get the same target. Get yeah, I want, I want to make this. Yeah, tell me how to make that. Hi, uh, reduction from ester, I guess. Okay. You're just you're just punting the ball down the down the field, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, he's running the clock down, trying to get some time. All right. So now we have an ester there. Now what? It's not a bad suggestion. How do we make that? Let's try um, Let's go back up to our box of wisdom. Here's our box of wisdom. The cheat sheet for making uh, isoquinolins. Are you seeing anything which uh, strikes your fancy? Yeah, the A plus B. Oh, okay. okay. That's uh, sounds interesting. So, <laughs> something like that, you say? Yeah, but we, we don't need hydrogenation this time, maybe. Aha, uh -huh. so you point to another way of doing this, which would be if one could find a, some sort of asymmetric pictet spangler, that would also be okay, wouldn't it? Or use the fish Browski to make that and then asymmetric hydrogenation screening on this, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Or one other strategy one could use is maybe along the lines of the AB disconnection, you could also think about taking a phenethylamine you have known and loved and coupling that with that, doing a Friedel crafts, and then just cyclizing that. Um, so yeah, all those disconnections will work. There's something else you can do. Um, how about ring substitution? Remember ring substitution? So what if we took, oops. the same intermediate that you wanted to screen hydrogenation, but not bearing the substituent. Is there a good way of adding in a one carbon unit to that position? Maybe through a name reaction we've already been exposed to? I think we had a whole lecture on this, didn't we? Didn't we go into a deep dive in this? Lecture number three, maybe? Yeah. Hmm. If you treat this with CBZ chloride, you're going to get that, right? Everybody remember that? Treat like a ricer. Uh huh. And then just treat it with KCN. And indeed, you will go in the literature and find that yes, people have done asymmetric ricer type reactions on isoquinolins. Well, that's not totally outside the realm of possibility. You would reduce here, reduce here, and you'd be done. So tons of really interesting disconnections here that you could brainstorm to give you access to this uh, isoquinolone. Thanks for your help there, Chen. All right, great. And we've got 15 minutes to finish this all new content. Real world consulting problems here. Um, so these are straight out of the archive. Uh, the first problem is how to make this strange cyanoisoquinolone. 
So we need all sorts of disconnections to, to get this one. And uh, maybe Debbie can help us with some disconnections here and uh, we'll start labeling the carbons to make it easy for you to suggest something. Yeah, uh, what if we disconnect uh, the double bond between three and two? And if we take a literal interpretation of what you're saying, it must mean we need something like that. And you want to do like a McMurray? Yeah, that's an option. Or just without the carbonyl close to the cyanyl. If you remove that and you imagine there an imine in the other side, like kind of an amine. I know that it's an amide, so oh, it's mean, not great. You, mean, you make the anion here? Yeah. Ah, that's an interesting idea. The only issue with this is that um, you've got an imid. Yeah. There's no base I can think of that won't just deprotonate that imid first. Um, however, maybe if this was protected first, you put some protecting group on here, uh, maybe that would give you a chance of working. That's possible. Or maybe we can break between uh, one and two, like. Hmm, now you're talking. That looks to be a little bit of a better feeling. So if we could somehow make that, or ester here, we convert it late, later to a nitrile, that would be good, wouldn't it? Yeah. So how do we make this in a really fast way? MedChem is fine. Mm. Well, we, we can consider the amide as a carboxylic acid. Sure, you can put whatever you want there. So maybe we can do some kind of a carboxylation. Aha, uh -huh. I want you to think in the exact opposite disconnection. So Debbie, what you just suggested was to break here. What I'm gonna suggest is that you break here because if you do that, you end up with something like that or an H2, whatever you want, and that. And you'll see in the book, there's a whole chapter on doing this type of thing uh, these undergo Ullman really well. So you can forge this CC bond really easily because it's an activated dicarbonyl. And then closure should happen in one pot to get you the desired product. So Debbie's disconnection got it straight, straight away. There's another way of looking at this, which is maybe not as intuitive. And that is one can think about this structure simply arising from this compound. Now, these intermediates are a great intermediate to end this lecture on because they're a great prequel to what we're going to see in the naphtheridine lecture on Wednesday. If I take this compound, uh, remember this because I'm going to be asking this over and over again next class. If I treat this compound with HBr, I get that compound. Don't forget that. However, if I take this compound and I treat it with something like acetic anhydride and sodium acetate, the product that I get out of this is that. 
And all I need to do to convert this to the product is a little base. How do you like them apples? Hydrolysis here, recyclization, hydrolysis there, and we get out the desired product. So these types of intermediates, these dicyano compounds are useful for making isoquinolones, but they're also really, really sneaky intermediates for making naphtheridines. You'll see this in the patent literature hundreds of times. All right, great. Let's move on to the final uh, consulting problem, which is, I don't know, from around 12 years ago, from somewhere, I don't even remember where. Um, and they wanted to make uh, these types of, um, you know, you, you, you see these questions a lot from med chemists. They're, the, when they're doing re sometimes programs where the structure is not known and there's no docking data, there's so much ambiguity. And so the questions you sometimes get are frustratingly broad. And the challenge for you is to give them as rapid a fashion as possible, the answer that gets them to the biological question. So faced with this challenge, hopefully we can get uh, Camille maybe to give us a thought on what might be good here. Um. We want both of these things. Yeah, so I guess it would make sense to break. Let me let me label it for you. Um, two, three. And by the way, X just means any substituent, not necessarily a halogen. So just view it as like alkyl or arrow, whatever you want. Uh, break two, three. If we break two, three, uh, again, you're looking to do what kind of reaction there? Like a like a McMurray type coupling? Uh, I guess, but that doesn't feel right, does it? No. Okay, good. That's good. That's great. Doing this in live fashion, we are exposed to everybody's thoughts at the same time, who I'm sure had that exact same thought. You know, when I'm looking at these problems, I'm also doing that too. Even today, I'll look at a problem like this. I disconnect every bond and I go in my head in a few seconds. Okay, not good. Next. Okay, not good, next. I keep going around the ring until I find a hit and then I zero in like a laser and then I give them a disconnection. So two, three, eh, not feeling so great. Anything else? One, two. One, two. One, two requires that we do. That, right? Yeah. And then, so you're using some nice 1,5 dicarbonyl logic. Uh, we've got to find a way to make this thing. The problem is when we try to make it by doing, let's say, palladium um, arylation or SNAR reactions, the main problem is we're going to have regiochemical issues, aren't we? How do you know you're going to enolize here and not here? There's another methylene here. Mm -hmm. Great. So we did one, two. We looked at it and we said, well, first we did two, three. We said no. Then we did one, two. We said, mm, not feeling it. Any other ones? Um, I'm fewer options now. Maybe uh, three, four. Yeah. This is what you, look, you did it. That's it. You did it. I mean, uh, I'm so happy to see that every, you know, that this class is actually working. That's it. So once you do that, You're done. So um, this is Laroc type logic, and the and the problem with this approach normally would be it would give you a regiochemical mixture. But guess what? The medicinal chemist just asked you for both, so you're fine. But for bonus points, you might say, well, what if they come back, Phil, and they say, now we know which regioisomer we want. Now what do we do? Well, we can still use Camille's retrosynthesis. All we're going to do is leave off one of these R groups. So NR, where R is usually equal to T-butyl. And uh, we do first the sonic shear with let's say R1 there. 
Then we treat this thing with, uh, you know, whatever you like, copper bromide will work. And now go ahead and put an R2. So even when they come back to you with the follow-up questions, they say, well, we isolated the mixture. We know one is active and one is not. Now we need to make one. We can still use what Ellie just said or Camille just said and do exactly what you want. And Camille got this after what? 30 seconds of thought? It's fantastic. I I have yeah. a question about suggesting this like regiochemical mixture. Like yeah. I understand why that's appealing, but it also sounds like separating those two would be a nightmare. Like you've oh, just- that's, sort of, that's a good question. And that's why when I went into the consulting question prompt, the answer, I gave them both, okay? So I didn't leave them hanging high and dry there. Now in the real world, all these companies have access to exquisite analytical capabilities and they will be able to separate the mixture. They don't even care about assigning the mixture, right? As long as they can separate it, it doesn't matter. Once you, once you find out, okay, one is active, now you give it to your NMR department, they do some HMBCs, they figure out which is the desired regioisomer, and then they need a stepwise fashion. But if neither of them is active, this scaffold is not good. That's okay, what that's chemist, really neat, yeah. yeah. So medicinal chemist cares about time. If this is a speculative scaffold, which it was, they take the mixture, separate them, they don't care which one is which, get the assay, the result comes back, neither is good, you move on. The person who sat in the corner trying to make a regiochemically pure one and wasted three weeks, they get demoted. The person who made the mixture and separated, they get promoted. Can we use the exact same logic here as well? Sure, why not? Uh, if you need this to be chiral, you can use Elman. But again, use the exact Camille disconnection that we just learned. after coupling would give you cyclization with something like copper bromide. Gives you that, Elman to get the chiral amine and we are good to go. Hey Phil, would you be able to do like a courteous type thing here as well? And like similar to what we saw earlier and then um, install the two chlorines with like PCL5? Would you be able to protect that chiral amine of some sort? So if we did this one and we did courteous heat, then halogenated, halogenated, and do your cross coupling to put the R group in here selectively, followed by the other one, and then Elman. This disconnection is fine. You could recommend that. I mean, it just depends on the different R groups. You know, we're not, um, we, you know, we don't know what their ARs are, but uh, we don't know what the R is here, but gee, you, you, you put that in, a, um, in an interview or on an exam, it's perfect, full credit. Great, great suggestion. All right, well, we have, Look at this, it's exactly 9.30. So we have uh, ended up exactly on time. So a question from the outside. Oh, did we skip a question? Oh, gee, uh, we skipped this. Oh, that, that's why we're on time, isn't it? <laughs> um, so, you know, for this one, uh, it's unfortunate that we skipped this one. You know what, let's move this to uh, Naphtheridine so we stay on time. We're gonna get to this one on Wednesday. 
uh, it's a really good one. Um, so if you want uh, to do a little homework, you can practice and think about how you might go ahead and, and put this together. This is a real consulting problem from the archives from many years ago. Uh, so think about that. Wednesday is going to be a lot of fun, an all new lecture where we talk about naphtheridines, which are the highest complexity before the midterm that we're going to get to. Um, so yeah, great. Hopefully you do the reading material, uh, take a little bit of a look at the book on, we have a naphtheridine section, and uh, we'll see you all on Wednesday.